Hello everyone, it's terrific to see um, such a lovely audience in here today. I'm Katrina Jackson, I'm CEO of Science and Technology Australia, um, and welcome. Uh, the aim of this series of forums is to tackle the really big issues, big issues in science, and it doesn't come much bigger than our energy future and what role, if any, nuclear might be able to play in that. We've got a terrific panel for you um, today and in a moment Genevieve Jacobs will introduce them all to you. Before we begin, however, I must thank the Inspiring Australia program in the Department of the Federal Department of Industry who fund this program and play a very vigorous part in making it as interesting and as flourishing as it can be. Thank you very much and I acknowledge the presence of um, Brenton Honeyman from Inspiring Australia down the front. <coughs> Excuse me. We deliberately like to make these forums as interactive as we possibly can, so there's a very generous allocation of time for question and answer, and Genevieve will moderate that. Please make sure, we're filming the event as you can tell from the cameras down the front, please make sure the microphone gets to you before you ask a question, otherwise you won't be on tape. The mics will be being run by two very skilled mic runners down both sides of the building, so just catch their eye and they'll make sure it's in your hand at the appropriate time. Um, if you'd like to take part in the debate via Twitter, um, I can see many Twitterers out there, um, please you use the hashtag nuclear debate. That means that everyone can see what you're saying and, and join in with you. Um, I think all that remains at this point is to ask people to turn off their mobile phones or any other tweeting, buzzing, beeping device they may have in their pocket, and I'll hand over to Genevieve Jacobs from ABC Triple Six to get things underway. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. Hello. Thank you for that very kind invitation, as always. I'm Genevieve Jacobs from 666 ABC Canberra, and I'm particularly interested to be in the chair for this discussion because I think we in this country, and we in this city in particular, are enmeshed in a, a very powerful and engaging debate about energy at the moment, where we get it from, how much it costs, and who's going to pay. And as regular ABC listeners will know, aside from the perennially fascinating Canberra discussion topic of who's got the right on the road, cars or bikes, there is no other topic that gets the talk back listeners going, like a chat about wind, for example. But if you don't like the look of the wind turbines, if you'd really rather not have a solar farm in your neighbourhood, then um, how's about a nuclear reactor? Just a little one, maybe up on Mount Stromlo. I'm joking, of course, or am I? Because in an age when we are consumed with how we are going to continue powering ourselves, it's genuinely puzzling to grapple with why the nuclear option is almost never discussed. We're here to try to understand that this afternoon, and you will be playing the major role. As Katrina said, I'm very keen to have your input and the kind of skilled questions I know to expect from a Canberra audience. I'd reiterate Katrina's request that you raise your hands for a question and wait until the microphone reaches you so that we can all hear your question. Please do tweet some of the striking and powerful things that our guests will say with the nuclear debate hashtag and remember to switch your phones to silent. Let me now introduce you to our panel. On the far left, Barry Brook, a leading environmental scientist who's professor at the University of Adelaide's Environment Institute, where he holds the Sir Hubert Wilkins Chair of Climate Change. Barry's published three books, refereed 250, uh, 250 refereed scientific papers, and he regularly writes popular articles for the media. He has a slew of awards, including the 2006 Australian Academy of Science Fenner Medal and the 2010 Community Science Educator of the Year. And Barry's research focuses on the causes and consequences of extinction, analysis of energy systems for carbon mitigation, and models of the synergies of human interactions with the biosphere. In the middle, Ian Hoare Lacey, a senior research analyst with the World Nuclear Association, which is an international trade association based in London. Ian's function is primarily focused on public information on nuclear power via the Web Information Library, where some 200 papers are kept up to date. He's the author of Nuclear Electricity, the 10th edition of which was published in 2012 by the World Nuclear University as Nuclear Energy in the 21st Century, including a Chinese edition. And Ian's particular interests range from the technical to the ethical and the theological aspects of mineral resources and their use, especially nuclear power. Next to me, Professor Ken Baldwin, Director of the Energy Change Institute at the ANU, where he's also Deputy Director of the Research School of Physics and Engineering. Since 2011, he's been a member of the Project Steering Committee for the Australian Energy Technology Assessment, 
produced by the Bureau of Resources and Energy Economics in the Department of Resources, Energy and Tourism. He's an inaugural ANU Public Policy Fellow and winner of the 2004 Australian Government Eureka Prize for promoting understanding of science for his role in initiating and championing Science Meets Parliament. That's a hard gig. <laughs> and to Ken goes my first question. Ken, when the atom was first split, it promised immense power. Why have we stopped talking about it and, and what it can potentially achieve? Well, Genevieve, uh, let me preface the answer to my question by just uh, saying that uh, it's our policy at the Australian National University Energy Change Institute to be both uh, technology and policy neutral. Uh, in other words, we, uh, we, we want to hear the benefits of all technologies and to see the research in them going forward. Uh, so when it comes to nuclear uh, energy, which as you say uh, is kind of off our radar and has been for some time, we want to make sure that uh, it is put out there on the radar with everyone and not removed out of the picture for ideological or other reasons. So uh, why is it that we've uh, not talked about nuclear power for so long? I think. Part of the reason is, in Australia, that we are energy rich. We are blessed with numerous resources in conventional fossil fuel, uh, energy sources in uh, uranium, which we export. And uranium is a, a very large energy export. It's about a third of the amount of energy that we export in coal. Uh, and of course, we have abundant uh, renewable resources in this country. For that reason, we haven't had to address the nuclear issue in the way that Europe, North America, other parts of the world have had to, because they need sources of energy that they don't have domestically in great abundance. Mm. So I think that's the, the main driver. But I also think we've taken a, a, a maybe uh, a slightly political view of things in the past. Uh, we've been very proactive when it comes to being strong for nuclear proliferation uh, issues. Uh, you can probably all remember the occasions in Mururoa in the South Pacific when Australia was at the forefront of uh, leading uh, action against nuclear testing in our region. So I think there's all those sort of political elements that feed into the debate as well. And so we've tended to shy away from addressing these really tough questions when it comes to what we should be doing in the future as far as nuclear energy is concerned. And it's really only come to the fore, I think, since climate change has now been recognised as the major problem confronting the modern, civilised and, and, and indeed the developing world. And people have perhaps changed their perspective as a result of that and they realise now that climate change is so important to address that we have to look at all the options we can put on the table. And to remove one of those, i.e. nuclear, is unsustainable in... Uh, the process that we need to move forward and address climate change. We've had a, a long and contentious history of argument over uranium mining, and I wonder mm. whether you think that that has coloured the debate over the use of nuclear energy in this country. It has to some degree, although clearly the reality is, as I said, we export around about one third of the amount of energy in uranium now that we export in coal. That is a huge turnaround from the position we had, let's say, a few decades ago. And so, although that might have initially coloured our, our perspective of the world, I think that's completely changed. We are benefiting from this uh, export resource. And really what we're talking about now is whether we join the rest of the nuclear cycle, which is to create energy using nuclear power and then storing the waste that results from that process. So we're already part of the nuclear fuel cycle when it comes to the global perspective. The question is, should we be a part of the full fuel cycle when it comes to our own domestic energy? Mm. Ian Hall, Lacey, when those of us who are lay people think about nuclear energy and nuclear events, uh, we often think of a series of names. We think Nagasaki, Hiroshima, we think Marilinga, we think Fukushima. These are Chernobyl, these are a, a litany of disasters. If something is tarnished, if it begins badly, is it tarnished forever? No. No, I don't think so. And the, those uh, disasters, and they are disasters, uh, the, uh, the three nuclear accidents you referred to... The Three Mile Island as well. The Three Mile Island, yes. but uh, they killed nobody at the, in terms of the general public. Uh, Chernobyl, there was a lot of uh, 56 staff, I think, were, and um, uh, others from um, um, le leukaemia. Uh, from um, thyroid cancer, 
but um, uh, the death toll, total death toll from that disaster was 50. The total death toll from the Fukushima disaster, which was even bigger, was zero. Uh, and the World Health Organization has um, underlined that. So no, I don't think so. I think if you look at the nuclear industry and, and including these disasters, um, then um, the, the safety of the technology is very obvious relative to alternatives. Um, and you can, br you can uh, bring out statistics uh, from um, other disasters which, uh, which hit the press. Uh, if there's a coal mine disaster that kills 100 people, uh, it's, uh, it's in the papers one day and gone the next and everybody's forgotten it mm. by the end of the week. But um, of course Chernobyl sticks around in the memory and so forth. So I think that um, I think people will see, and and some of the most strident anti-nuclear activists in the northern hemisphere have seen that. Look, uh, if you can have a disaster as bad as Fukushima uh, and kill nobody and hurt hurt nobody from that, despite 19,000 being killed by the tsunami itself, which triggered the thing, uh, then it's got a lot going for it. Can you contrast for me the discussion here, or the absence of discussion here, with what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere, in the United Kingdom, for example, with this notion that nuclear is an answer to the quest for alternative energy sources? Yeah, well, the UK is in a very different position to us. Um, in fact, most, most countries that, uh, that are considering nuclear are very different. There are three drivers uh, for nuclear power in most countries. Uh, one is simply the cost of electricity. It's often going to be cheapest. Second is energy security, uh, because you can store a year or two's supply of uranium or finished fuel in a, in a shed down the road, no problem at all. Uh, you can't do that with uh, gas or coal. Uh, and, uh, and energy security is a very big issue, uh, has come into prominence in the UK particularly uh, because of their dependence on Siberia and the fact that their uh, North Sea gas fields are running down. Uh, and the third, of course, is greenhouse gas emissions. Now for Australia, the greenhouse gas emission is really the only argument because we've got heaps and heaps of good coal. Um, and so there's no energy security issue from the point of view of electricity. Uh, and that coal is very conveniently located and cheap to burn, so nuclear is not going to be an economic advantage, although with the way electricity prices have gone up, one perhaps needs to reevaluate that. Um, but, so it's just the CO2 driver in Australia. Okay. But the, the UK, I mean, the 2003 white paper in the UK was a little bit like our recent uh, three years ago white paper here that sort of said, well, look, renewables are obviously the way to go um, and uh, nuclear, yeah, well, sort of interesting and maybe and just, you know, a little, little paragraph out and almost in the margin of the whole argument. Uh, that was 2003. Now, the, in the last couple of years, the UK on a bipartisan basis has been more... Uh, positive about uh, a program for nuclear power than any country in the world. And that's just in less than 10 years. Mm. Uh, Barry, what's the promise that nuclear holds out that meets an immediate need in this country? Will it be, for example, faster to bring on load than renewables? Will it achieve baseload power more effectively? What, what's the value in it for us? Well, as Ian pointed out, our major concern for going down nuclear uh, or or renewable energy pathways is to mitigate climate change, to cut our carbon dioxide emissions. Otherwise, we continue to burn our coal. We currently get 80% of our electricity from coal and we could continue to do so for many centuries. So there has to be a motivation for change and it's that we want to clean up our, our carbon pollution and renewables seem like a good way to do it. But my main argument for nuclear is that we know historically it's been the coal killer. It's been a technology that in various countries has actually done the job comprehensively. So we've had a number of countries which were heavily dependent on fossil fuels and weaned themselves off them completely using nuclear. And we've got a range of others where nuclear has formed a large component where they've also been blessed with other energy sources like hydro or geothermal. So countries like Sweden, Switzerland and Iceland. We haven't unfortunately got any example like that for wind and solar. We've got some countries that have pursued it vigorously, like Denmark and Germany, and invested a lot. And they're now getting, if you add up their total energy supply, somewhere between 10 and 20% from these sources. But they're in an interesting geographic situation where they're in interconnected grids and they can export and import energy when there are deficits. And 
10 to 20% isn't going to solve the climate problem. We need to get to 80, 90, and eventually 100%. So for those two reasons, I would say it's actually a very risky strategy for Australia to say we don't need nuclear, we don't need that known coal killer here. We need to essentially rest our whole climate change mitigation argument on hope. Now, I hope, as much as most people, that wind and solar can play a much larger role in the future. But I hope more vehemently that we can actually have a rational view to getting rid of coal. And to me, that says that we must have nuclear energy as part of the mix. But aren't you describing a situation in which we are running with the current paradigm that we need plenty of energy and we need it as cheaply as possible, while the picture for renewables in the future is inevitably a large patchwork of sources. We certainly have issues with storage and the like to, to work out how we're going to do that. But shouldn't we be looking at shifting our understanding and our approach to power generation rather than relying on a source that has some inherent dangers, and we'll discuss those in a moment, uh, in order to generate power quickly and effectively and cheaply, rather than shifting the way that we understand the whole question? There are certainly major improvements we can make in distributed energy generation, mm -hmm. uh, especially in terms of households. They can put solar panels on their roof and they can become little power stations. You, with better infrastructure, we can have a more connected grid where we can manage load imbalances much better. We can definitely have solutions that improve the way we can use those distributed renewables. But to run a large economy reliably, to make sure that we always have enough power for hospitals and for all of the infrastructure that we require as a fundamental bedrock of our society, again, we come back to this point that we don't know that we can run any of those on these distributed sources. And in fact, we know there are many challenges right now that we simply haven't overcome. And some of them we hope we will. We hope that energy storage will become more ubiquitous and cheaper. We hope that we'll find even better ways of managing the grid. But ultimately, it's hope, hope, hope. Again, and I don't want to hope for a future rather than building a future which <clears throat> I know can work. So I don't think any of us here are arguing that there won't be a larger role for wind and solar and that it could be a major contributor. But we are saying that we need to ensure that we have all of these options available to us. Because if we get 10 or 20 years down the track and we've closed off the nuclear option and we found that the great hope for wind and solar isn't materialising for various reasons that we can think of now and plenty others that we haven't even imagined, then we're going to be stuck with coal. And that is a situation as a climate scientist I'm not particularly attracted to. Ken, who bears the cost for nuclear? Is this a public or a private venture? How do you indeed calculate the full costs? Well, that's a, a very good question because uh, clearly uh, the experience around the world is that governments primarily have been, if you like, the guarantor of last resort for the nuclear power industry uh, if there are issues that relate to uh, waste uh, disposal and uh, that sort of thing, the, taking the risk uh, in the long term. It's always governments that step into this role and that's quite rightly so because uh, there is a role for government where the market fails, and clearly the market fails in these very, very big types of issues. So, so that's, that's how things have worked. If we look at the costs, for example, uh, the cost of storing nuclear waste, which is, again, uh, something that government is, uh, is acting as the regulator uh, to uh, make sure is done properly, these typically uh, amount to around 1% or 2% of the what's called the levelised cost of electricity generated by nuclear. So it's not a very large component of the total cost, but it's one that I think has to be addressed by a government uh, in a regulatory environment. And uh, in terms of how do you work out the costs, well, the Australian Energy Technology Assessment, for example, uses this term levelised cost of electricity. What this means is that you take all the operational costs for generating energy, you take into account the capital cost for building the plant, you amortise that over the lifetime of the plant and take into account the financing and all these other factors. And then you end up with a number which, when you uh, divide it by the amount of energy that you generate, gives you a dollars per megawatt hour of energy. And uh, typically, uh, you know, a good number uh, that, <coughs> that is, um, is thought of in the industry as being uh, an economically viable amount is around about $100 or so per megawatt hour. And if you look at the projections of the Australian Energy Technology Assessment for 2020, which is kind of the time frame where we're starting to see a lot of our coal-fired power stations retire, then what we find that without a carbon price, 
wind power is very, very competitive, as it is indeed today, uh, that uh, the uh, nuclear industry is starting to become competitive at that point, and then sometime further down the track, large-scale solar, as opposed to the rooftop solar that was mentioned before, starts to become attractive as well. So if you look at it over a period of time, a whole lot of new energy sources come into play. And what we have to decide is whether we're going to have the regulatory environment in place to allow this to happen. So in other words, if nuclear came into play economically, that we would not have to wait another decade in order to set up the right conditions. And the other thing, of course, we need to decide as a nation, and you know, we're all aware of what is happening in the political environment at the moment, is whether we reflect the true cost to the future generations of putting more carbon into the atmosphere. So if we do go back to having a price on carbon, whatever that means, an emissions trading scheme or whatever, then uh, Australia will be joining the rest of the world uh, in that process. And when that happens, that changes the whole mix when it comes to looking at different energy sources and their economics. So quite clearly then, renewables and nuclear become much more competitive compared to typical fossil fuel generated sources such as coal and gas. Does that analysis of the costs include a long-term analysis of the possibility, first of all, of accidents, which might well be rare but could certainly be catastrophic, potentially, mm -hmm. and also the disposal of the waste material? Uh, it takes into account uh, the fact that waste material disposal is a very small component, i.e. 1 or 2 per cent of the total cost. Uh, it doesn't take into account the long-term risk of accidents. But let's remember, the accidents that we've had so far have been accidents in power stations that were built many decades ago and were designed decades before that. In the modern world, the next generation of nuclear reactors will be completely different to those reactors. They will be much safer, they will have automatic fail-safe mechanisms so that even if all the power goes out and uh, there is complete isolation of the reactor from any form of intervention, the system will simply shut down. And the risk associated with these modern reactors will be so much less than that which we've seen in the reactors which have caused problems so far that that component will be quite readily borne by government because they realise that that aspect of the nuclear power generation cost is significantly low and they can afford to do that. Uh, Ian, uh, yes. Could I just chip in on that? that that's um, a support what Ken said. But uh, the other thing that's becoming obvious at the moment in the Northern Hemisphere, most uh, dramatically in Germany, which has pursued uh, the installation of wind and solar capacity with, with a vengeance and with huge subsidies, uh, is that uh, you need to be thinking about the system costs, uh, not just the levelised cost at the generating plant, but also the uh, transmission costs in connecting that to where the power is needed, uh, and the backup costs, because uh, no amount of technology is going to make the sun shine overnight, no amount of technology is going to make the wind blow when it isn't. Uh, so you've got to start thinking about the total system costs. And when you do that for renewables, uh, it is quite considerable. And uh, it's very interesting to read the details of what's going on in Germany at the moment. Um, you know, here they, they've embarked upon this in order to reduce carbon emissions. So what's been the, one of the main results at this point in time is that they're building 10 gigawatts of new coal-fired power generation, for goodness sake. Uh, and the gas-fired generators are going out backwards. Uh, they're going broke. And, and this is the main backup you need for your intermittent renewables. So um, there's a whole range of thinking going on now about these system costs which need to be factored in uh, with regard to renewables. And that comparison with nuclear uh, makes nuclear look a whole lot better th even than it has just on the liberalised cost basis. And, Ian, I also wanted to ask you, Ken mentioned a moment ago a regulatory framework. What are the ethical foundations for approaching this? What, what are the foundations on which we'd need to lay such a framework, uh, apart from the mechanics of legislation? I think the, 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 the main ethical foundation, I think, is uh, the provision of energy that people need for the lifestyle they aspire to. Uh, and one of the big drivers in the world at the moment is that uh, about two billion people of the world's population do not have access to reliable, affordable electricity, uh, if any electricity at all in some cases. Uh, and, and I think that, that provision uh, of what 
we take for granted as a basic resource for living uh, is, is the main one. Mm, although we, we're talking about providing power in a, develop, in a developed nation like this one, you know, isn't it a better answer to work with people to reduce their energy consumption and to make it more efficient so that we need less while we're bringing less potentially harmful methods of power generation on board? Well, you can argue that. I, I, I don't think that using less energy in a country like this is necessarily a very strong driver, mm -hmm. uh, unless that's going to help somebody else, and I, I can't see that it is. Um, but the, the, the provision obviously needs to be safe, it needs to be environmentally sound, uh, which is again, you know, coming back to the nuclear's main um, attribute, in the, particularly from the Australian perspective. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's really provision for, the, for those people that have got very, very little at the moment in the way of reliable power. I'm going to open up to the floor in just a moment, but uh, Barry, I just want to go to you and ask you about the environmental impact of nuclear in terms of framing this discussion. If we measure this up against the damage caused by coal, you're still hauling uranium out of the ground. There's still an environmental impact in setting the whole process up, isn't there? There is, but because nuclear fuel is so dense, the impact's tiny. Uh, so if we think about where Australia gets its uranium and it exports sizable fraction of the world's uranium supply. It gets it predominantly out of Olympic Dam, which is a polymetallic mine, so it's primarily used for mining zinc and copper and gold and silver. So uranium's a byproduct of that. Then other mines that have opened in Australia have used in situ leach mining, so they don't actually even open up the surface. It's all done through extraction from underground resources. And Kazakhstan is the world's largest uranium exporter now gets it all from in situ leach mining. So the mining footprint of uranium is actually quite small. Uh, the fuel footprint is quite small because, again, it's so concentrated. And if you recycle uranium fully in a next generation reactor, then it becomes ridiculously small. And I, I use a comparison that if you were to run your whole life just on uranium that was fully recycled, you could do it all in something the size of a golf ball of uranium, that's your entire legacy. And that's not just your electricity, that's energy to make synthetic fuels to drive your car and to power the aircraft to fly around the world to grow your food, all of that in the Gulf War. Now if you were to do the equivalent of that with coal, which is still a relatively concentrated form of energy, require around 3,000 tonnes of coal, which to visualise that is like if an elephant was made out of coal, this would be like 800 elephants worth of coal. That's every single person's legacy of coal. And the final comparison I like is if you were to store that energy in a battery, a, a nickel metal hydride battery like you put in a Prius car, the battery, if it was the size of an elevator shaft, would be the equivalent of the elevator shaft in the Burj Khalifa skyscraper, the tallest skyscraper in the world, stacked 13 on top of each other. Now, that's basically the best commercial battery technology we have. It's great, but it's not actually very energy dense. Uranium is incredibly energy dense, and that's why it has such a low environmental footprint. Really, the only credible, significant environmental impact of nuclear energy is when we have a catastrophic accident. And even then, the major damage is that people evacuate an area and it causes huge displacement problems and there is a risk of exposure, although it typically hasn't happened to the public. Uh, but if we can work to ensure that those types of accidents are virtually never happen, and so a next generation reactor with passive safety systems, the inherent safety systems that Ken talked about, uh, the estimate is that you would have a, a kind of accident of the type of Three Mile Island in that once every 500,000 years or so uh, of operating time for a reactor, which is just vastly safer than the current ones, even though the current ones are already very safe. So to me, a good reason, apart from the carbon emissions to advocate for nuclear, is it's so concentrated, the problem is so small, and we can keep it enclosed that way. OK, let's turn it over to you, and I'd love you to raise your hand if you've got a question. We'll get the microphone to you. We've got a microphone on either side of the room, and I think we'll just go down here first to you, sir. Yeah, you're right. I'd like the panel to comment on what will drive this transition to nuclear globally. Is you, in the Australian context, Ken talked about a, a carbon price. Is that a global agreement through, you know, with the... the Climate Summit coming up in Paris in 2015 or moving on from that, is that, that, will that be very important in pushing a global 
move towards much more nuclear? Uh, Ken, I might go to you on that. So, on the, on the drivers for mm. this kind of transition. So, I mean, we could have an entire discussion afternoon about a carbon price, and uh, it's already been done many times. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that what we will see is that the rest of the world will move towards uh, some way of putting a price on carbon, whether it be an emissions trading scheme, a carbon tax, whatever, uh, that Australia could potentially be isolated in that circumstance and that indeed this might affect our export capability because other nations may decide to impose a carbon price on anything that contains a, an element of carbon that we might export from this country. So increasingly we will be in a world which has a price on carbon in one form or another. Will that be a driver for nuclear? I think it will because uh, it will add significantly to the cost of using fossil fuels. Uh, in particular, the Australian Energy Technology Assessment demonstrated that by uh, removing the price on carbon that you pushed out the uh, point at which nuclear became uh, a comparable option by a number of years and indeed uh, it obviously uh, entrenched the uh, current fossil fuel generators uh, because the true cost of generating electricity uh, and causing climate change is not included in, the, in, the, in their levelised cost of electricity. So I think it is a driver. Uh, it depends entirely upon whether the carbon price reflects the immediacy with which we need to address climate change. If we choose a low carbon price, if that's the way things develop, then what that really means is that we're paying a low price and our children and our grandchildren will be paying a much higher price in the future. Nuclear will then be pushed out into their generation to make a, a, a decision on this if the price on carbon is kept low. If the carbon price is a much truer reflection of what we need to do to keep the world's temperature below two degrees, then that will advance the point at which nuclear becomes more economically viable. OK, I think we've got a question up the back there. Yes. Uh, three issues haven't been addressed, I don't think. One is the, um, uh, the cost of decommissioning reactors, um, or the cost of building them and decommissioning them, both in monetary terms and in greenhouse terms. Um, another one is the risk of terrorism, diversion of nuclear materials to make bombs for, by terrorists. And the third issue is um, the amount of uh, um, uranium that exists, because I understand that uh, uranium, like oil and uh, coal, will also peak sometime in the next um, decade or so. So um, if we build a whole lot of nuclear generators, will there be enough uranium? OK. Uh, Barry, is uranium a finite resource? Uh, not really. I mean, the reason resources peak is that it becomes uncompetitive to extract them. Um, and so as long as the price of uranium stays cheaper than that of gold, it will be worth extracting it if you actually calculate how little you use in a reactor. But the big boon for either uranium or thorium as another nuclear fuel is that when you recycle, fully recycle these fuels, you get around 150 times more energy out of the uranium than you do today. And so that means all of the nuclear waste that we've gathered over the last uh, 50 years of operation, if, if you've stopped mining uranium completely, you'd have enough to power the whole world at current energy levels for around 500 years, just using up that waste before we actually even needed to go and mine any more uranium. And then if you work out the amount of resources that are estimated to exist at an extraction of, of less than $150 a kilogram, then we've probably got around 10,000 years of ready supply when you recycle the uranium, and that's before you go to the thorium. Now, if we haven't worked out fusion energy or something else in 10,000 years, then I would be surprised. So in that sense, I consider nuclear fission to be entirely sustainable, essentially inexhaustible in any meaningful time frame. OK. Ian, let me ask you about that, uh, that notion of social risks, if I can phrase it like that, that, that the uranium falls into the wrong hands, that we are proliferating the amount of resources for someone who has ill intentions. Well, I think that's been a, uh, a factor in political uh, consideration for since certainly well before 1970. 
But in 1970, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty came in, uh, and since then there have been international safeguards applied to the trading of uranium and related materials, and arguably that's been the most successful United Nations program ever. Uh, and so, th so there is a very um, strong curb kept on that, uh, and I could uh, speak, speak, speak much more on that. I think in terms of terrorist access to fissile materials, uh, yes, there's some potential for dirty bombs and so forth, but there's uh, far more uh, scope for terrorists doing nasty things uh, in terms of polluting uh, and hazarding people's health with uh, non-nuclear wastes and non-nuclear materials that are um, uh, readily available, or not too readily available, but they're certainly available in, a, in, in our cities now. Mm. And addressing just the decommissioning question, part of the question from up the back, yes, that's, uh, that's a major thing, and there have been uh, now, I think, over 100 uh, nuclear reactors taken out of service. Uh, the costs are very well understood, and they are not great. They are about the same magnitude as the uh, internalising the cost of the wastes, uh, they're normally handled by something like a superannuation fund for each reactor, uh, whereby a little bit of money is paid in every year, and when you shut the thing down, there's a big, uh, big amount there which pays for the dismantling and so on. Okay. That's, it's not a hassle. Uh, this gentleman, I think you had your hand up first of all, actually. We've just got the microphone right. to you. Thank you. Testing. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering about the question of the environmental impact of uh, the mining that's needed for renewable resources. I mean, there was a comparison made between uh, mining coal and mining uranium, but, uh, I mean, solar panels and wind farms and uh, the rest of it don't appear out of thin air. They all have to be mined too. So I was wondering if anyone could speak to the comparison between nuclear and renewables on a kilowatt hour basis and uh, impact. Uh, Barry, is that one you can tackle? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it's quite right that, that it takes significant uh, infrastructure to build power plants that are required to capture diffuse energy. So s sunlight and wind um, are not concentrated forms of energy like fossil fuels and uranium. They're, they're dispersed. So you need to cover large areas to capture them. Um, so wind, you get on average around um, two, kilowatts, uh, two watts per square metre and solar in the best locations, maybe 35 to 40, which means to have a large power plant, you need to cover a vast area. And to build those, traditionally, it's a lot of steel, a lot of concrete, and a lot of land area. And you calculate the amount um, compared to building a large monolithic nuclear plant, which certainly takes a lot of steel and concrete. It's a, b it's a big industrial infrastructure. And it's on the order of somewhere between 100 to 300 to 1 ratio in favour of the nuclear plants. It's just all concentrated in one spot where people can see it, mm. whereas you don't tend to see the more dispersed structures. But they're significant. Mm. They're not significant enough that they can't pay that energy and material cost back, but they are a real consideration. And one can't say on the one hand that look at all the concrete and steel in that nuclear power plant and forget about it in anything else. Yeah, Ken, I might just ask you on that. Describe to me, or describe to the audience, how big these nuclear power plants would be, what they might look like, because I think the public perception of the infrastructure is perhaps quite different to the way the technology has evolved in recent years. Yes, well, I mean, if you look at a major power station, which might be, let's say, between one and two gigawatts, uh, that would be powered by conventional fuels, you could just plug and play effectively a nuclear power station inside that infrastructure. What you need is something that creates a lot of heat in a thermal power plant, and then that heat is extracted through steam or whatever the process, and you generate electricity in the turbine. So you could replace the central part of a conventional fossil fuel power station with a nuclear power station, be very similar. But you could also scale it down. Uh, so there are small modular reactors, as they're called in the, in the trade, uh, that produce maybe uh, 200 megawatts of power, the typical size of something that maybe uh, you'd have inside a, a very large ship. Uh, and you could build up in stages a full-scale uh, power station from these small modular reactors and, and do things uh, at a rate that is, um, is, that is appropriate for, the, for your needs. And indeed, you could have a standalone version of one of these things, maybe sitting out in a desert powering a remote mining operation, for example. Uh, so there is uh, a prospect for introducing a relatively small modular reactor 
into the Australian economy in a way that uh, isn't the same as replacing the whole carbon uh, fleet of power stations in one hit and, uh, and trialling it in, in this way. OK. Um, a gentleman down here. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's lovely to see that we have numbers of optimists out the front. Um, I think the figure was mentioned by the person on the right, Barry, uh, 500,000 years expected mean time between failure. That just seems incredibly um, unrealistic in terms of our previous experience. And in particular, you seem to be advocating the wholesale adoption of recycling of the uh, waste material stream rather than having, a, as we currently have, a once through cycle. And there's a very good reason why that has been adopted, because of the enormous difficulties that have been experienced in the real world of cellophile reprocessing. I think you'd find a lot of people would disagree with your um, feeling that that is the best way to go and on the time frame. The other thing that you mentioned in particular about the advocacy of nuclear power as a greenhouse-friendly solution, that simply does not accord with the facts. For the first generation of nuclear power plants, certainly the available uranium fuel would be mineable and at a particular price that would make it economic and would make it so that it would be greenhouse friendly. When you look at the lower grade ores, which would be necessary for the second generation of reactors, the, there is a degree of agreement that it is far more ex expensive. There is much more investment of energy into refining that fuel and it becomes greenhouse unfriendly. In other words, it uses more energy than it generates. And that, I think, is one of the fundamental objections. Unless you go down the reprocessing route, that to justify um, on the greenhouse friendly component of your argument is totally false. Uh, I'll go to Barry first and then to you if I can, Ian. Yes? Uh, as I mentioned, if you do go down the uh, recycling route, and I called it recycling uh, for a reason. Uh, traditionally, as the gentleman pointed out, there's a process called reprocessing, which is essentially taking a small component of the actinides that are bred in our reactors, such as plutonium, and repackaging that with some fresh uranium to make some new fuel. But you can really only do that once, maybe twice, and you get about 15% more energy out of the uranium as a result. That's the traditional way that's done in France, for instance. However, if you recycle it in a fast reactor, then it's a completely different process. It's, for instance, a pyro process, where the fuel can be quite dirty, in the sense it can be mixed up with lots of things, and continually recycled, not once, but 50, 100 times, so that all the energy is extracted. So instead of being 15% more efficient, it's 150 times more efficient, just a vastly different scale. Now, it hasn't been done to date for a number of reasons. One of them is that, yes, there were definitely technological barriers to overcome. Fortunately, they seem to have been overcome, uh, but it's not commercialised because uranium remains relatively cheap, and until anyone decides to do something serious about the waste, it's not going to be a high priority. So it's, it's a complex story. But there are fundamental reasons why we haven't recycled to date, and they're not principally technological barriers. Now, that, that comment, which may have sounded flippant about an accident once every 500 years, would be utterly implausible if it was based on an argument on engineered safety systems, the kind of safety systems that we've traditionally developed for nuclear power plants and a whole range of others, where if you have this accident and this lever, or this valve opens, you know, a whole range of mechanical systems to try and shut the reactor down. I'm talking about inherent safety systems that depend on the laws of physics. So, for instance, if you have uh, a vat of liquid metal that is cooling your reactor, that has sufficient capacity to just radiate the heat that there's no need for an intervention in, such as cooling water. You have a fuel that's a metal rather than an oxide, so as it heats up, its reactivity actually drops because it leaks neutrons to the point where it can't maintain the nuclear reaction. It just can't do it unless it violates the laws of physics. So you put those two together and you've got this fuel that swells and stops reacting. You've got this vat of metal that just radiates passively the heat. 
Now, these are, are things that people don't need to intervene in in order to deal with. And that's what I'm talking about with inherent safety system, inherent based on the laws of physics. And there is where those probabilistic risk assessments, and they're not numbers that people pull out the air, they're very detailed actuarial calculations. That's the basis on which they're made. So fundamentally, entirely different from the engineered safety systems that we've traditionally run. And Ian, you want to make a comment? Two important points raised. One is about uh, reprocessing. Uh, yes, the British programs had some major hiccups, uh, but look at the French program. Uh, they're recycling nearly all their fuel at the moment, uh, doing it in the rather inefficient way, according to Barry's um, future view. Uh, but they're doing it. It's fairly expensive, uh, but it's really paid for by the offset of uh, much less high-level waste to be disposed of. But it's very, very successful, it's, and it's ongoing. Uh, and it yields a sort of a side dividend of reprocessed uranium, which is a f which can be used. It's not most of it's not being used at the moment. With regard to the Dutch website that I think you're quoting, uh, it's nonsense. Uh, with regard to very low-grade ores, um, uh, that's the, the guy who runs that is uh, who's made those assertions, which are very widely quoted. Uh, I think has no empirical um, uh, experience of the industry at all. Uh, and um, the, the, the actual numbers are that if you go down to uh, mining hard rock ores of about 0.01%, uh, yes, your energy input to the fuel cycle does go up, uh, it, and it goes up um, you know, so that you're only getting about 20 times as much energy out as you put into the whole fuel cycle instead of 30 times. But you're nowhere near uh, parity. Mm. Uh, Barry? Just a final point on that. There's another way to think about it. If, if you recycled uranium completely so we could run the world for 500 years on it, mm. then by the time we got to the point where we'd have to mine a lower grade ores, the, the carbon footprint of mining would be zero yeah. because it'd be running on some mix of nuclear and renewables anyway. Yeah. And so the only reason mining nuclear has a carbon footprint is because we use diesel fuel and fossil fuels to run the reprocessing plants and so on. If you didn't do that, if it was all renewables and nuclear, then the carbon footprint of mining would be zero. Yep. And so at any sort of imaginable level at which we'd have to go to those low-grade ores, we would already have a carbon-neutral economy. The, the carbon footprint of almost any product is a product of the carbon intensity of the economy. OK. Uh, up in the middle there, yeah. Thank you. I'd just like to follow on from the question before last about the... Uh, mining impacts of non-nuclear uh, renewable energies. So I hear at the moment that, it, for the example, the Linus mine uh, that's producing rare earth metals actually also generates low-level uh, radioactive waste. How does the environmental impact of dealing with those wastes co um, compare to that of nuclear? And also I'd like to uh, bring up the combustion of coal itself actually generates some solid residues that are environmentally damaging in the disposal of them. How does the processing and disposal of those compare to the of final waste products of uh, nuclear energy that we have to deal with? Um, Ken, would you...? Well, actually, I might defer to Barry defer to on Barry? that question. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, there's one interesting fact with coal, and that is if you take the amount of trace uranium and thorium in the ash and soot and so forth, and you, if you could collect all of that diffuse uranium, it would actually, and run it through a fast reactor, it would actually produce about 10 times more energy than you got from burning the coal. That, I mean, there's not much uranium in there, but there's enough that's dispersed widely in the air that no one really cares about, that no one thinks about, no one regulates, uh, that, that is actually a really inc incredibly concentrated form of energy. And people talked about mining coal ash, in fact, to get uranium out. But the, the broader point is that Yes, there are environmental impacts on all of these energy systems. You go and create a rare earth mine to create the magnets for the wind turbines. There is an impact of it. There is a measurable impact, and it has to be traded off against other impacts. Certainly, we know that the impacts of burning coal and releasing neurotoxins and various heavy metals, soot and ash that causes particulate pollution and lung disease and all that, I mean, they are real and quantifiable and orders of magnitude greater than for mining for, for nuclear or for wind and solar. So we must put all those in perspective and we can't concentrate on the environmental impa impacts of an energy source that for various reasons we don't like and ignore or downplay the ones of the other. But we have to look at them in, again, this is what we keep repeating, 
in a, in a sort of level playing field and judge the pros and cons of each of these energy sources fairly and in a balanced and evidence-based way. And I think, Ken, that goes to your point about how important it is to have the discussion on a level playing field and to weigh up all those options rather than to excluding one energy source or another because of prejudice or the political mood of the day. Indeed, and, uh, and I think it's, it's all about uh, performing, if you like, a very grand risk assessment exercise. And uh, politicians understand this. They do this every day when they make a decision on when to spend a dollar on health or a dollar on education or a dollar on defence or a dollar on energy. It happens all the time. What we're doing in the case of, uh, of generating energy by different sources, nuclear, solar, wind, fossil fuels, is doing a risk assessment on whether it's better to spend a dollar on investing in new production methods in any of those different areas, taking into account the full picture, the mining, the creation of the plant, the running of the plant, the disposal of the plant, and the byproducts that are created in all those processes. And if you take into account all those environmental factors, particularly the fact that uh, carbon in the atmosphere has an enormous effect on not only health but economy, on uh, our sense of well-being and all these other things, as well as the radioactivity that comes from burning coal and other fossil fuels, the radioactivity that might be created in the mining of uranium uh, and in the, in the uh, use of uranium as a fuel and potential accidents, you take all these factors into account into one big global calculation and then balance them off against each other and then make a rational decision about which of these avenues we should pursue. And perhaps yep. the answer is we pursue all of them maybe not all equally necessarily, but certainly all the non-carbon avenues in order to achieve the main game, which is going to be to stop global warming from producing a, an effect on our future generations that we won't be paying for, but they will be. OK. Uh, gentleman up here. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, Dr Michael Fulham. I'm an energy engineer. And when John Howard proposed Building 25, uh, Russian nuclear power stations in Australia. Uh, he invited a uh, debate of the nuclear power proposal. I uh, uh, produced with an ABC presenter six 30-minute radio programs uh, evaluating his proposal with 35 criteria and we concluded at the end of the final program that it didn't satisfy a single criteria, uh, particularly in the uh, Australian environment where we have many alternatives and some of the justifications uh, don't seem to be related to the energy cycle like most of the uh, countries that produce nuclear power use it because they want to produce nuclear weapons from the byproduct. So I couldn't find any justification whatsoever and I've heard no, not a single point today that's changed my opinion on any one of those criteria. Uh, Ken, would you like to address that question of people's <laughs> real priorities in, in using and utilising nuclear power? And is it as simple as wanting access to that, to that weapon within the world? No, I don't think it is. And, uh, and indeed, that was a long time ago, I might say. And things have changed. And we are that much closer to a warmer world that we need to do something even more drastically about than we did a decade ago in order to stop that warming happening. So we're in an entirely different environment now where people are realising you've got to place a true price on what we're doing to the planet by generating energy in whatever form it is, but in particular if we're using fossil fuel energy. So now is a different era. We're in a world where countries are moving in a concerted fashion towards having a price on carbon that reflects the effect that that has on our future generations. And when that happens, we have to make different choices about the types of energy that we use. Now, Australia, as I said at the beginning, do you want to finish my answer first? Well, well, well <laughs> no, no, I'm going it, to let Ken respect, finish his answer. <laughs> with, with respect. That's, that's a different question. And you can have a, another session about geopolitics as well, if you like. But the key thing is that we're in a different world now where we have to act very rapidly 
in order to do something about the change to our planet that is caused by fossil fuel emissions. And that's why we have to have this debate. And look, we do have uh, lots of questions here, and I'm trying to get to all of those people who are catching my eye and I'm nodding at you. I've, you're not <laughs> forgotten. We're getting you the microphone as quickly as we can. Now, I think, uh, yes, we've got you in the middle of the room. Yep, go ahead. Um, it's along the lines of what uh, Barry was saying earlier. Um, when people say the word nuclear, they assume uranium. I'm glad to hear the word thorium come out. Um, to address some of the uh, uh, weaponisation aspects, if we got away from uranium, that would be good. But what I'm curious about is um, my research has shown really positive and really negative things about using alternative nuclear fuels such as thorium. What is the current state of play with thorium, please? Barry? Uh, well, thorium is like most of uranium in that you can't use it as a nuclear fuel directly. The way you use thorium is by converting it into a special form of uranium, uranium-233, which you can then burn in a traditional um, nuclear reaction. Uh, so that comes with its costs and benefits. If, you, if it's not an original nuclear fuel, it means you've got to breed it, so you have to have a breeder reactor. So you have to have a reactor that can convert that fertile thorium into something usable. Uh, but it does introduce, it does mean that you're forced to use a system which is actually really good in many ways. It's, you're forced to use a system that's inherently safe, that is inherently based on recycling the fuel. All of this is packaged up with being able to use thorium, which is why thorium appears to have so many of these advantages. Its biggest disadvantages are that it's an immature technology. Um, it's not competitive with traditional uranium sources right now simply because it hasn't been pursued on a commercial scale. The type of recycling I was referring to for uranium is essentially the same technology as you would have to use for thorium. Uh, so you can't say oh, thorium's great, uranium's bad. Thorium and recycled uranium are basically one product and once through um, uranium fission is another product. Now once through uranium fission has a finite lifespan, but it's still a much better technology than almost everything else we have. And, but my view is definitely that if nuclear power is to be a sustainable contributor to our energy future, we must sooner rather than later pursue these alternative technologies. We don't need to do it next year to start. We don't need to do it in a decade or two decades, but we do need to get well on the road to deploying these sorts of technologies. Then the big advantages of thorium should be realised and the big advantages of recycling uranium and all of the carbon benefits that go along with that and the safety benefits will come in train. Okay, uh, yes, Abby. Um, that's actually a beautiful segue into my question. Um, you sp the panel's spoken about recycling and proliferation. Um, one thing that has been mentioned is things such as the megatons to megawatts program, which actually took weapons, you know, nuclear weapons, that proliferation risk, and turned it into nuclear fuel. Now, that program's coming to an end. You know, is that something that the nuclear industry, not just governments, should be pursuing as part of this addressing proliferation, um, that concern of this fuel um, type? Barry? Actually, it, it, it's interesting that you pointed out that the single biggest motivating factor to most governments right now for building this new generation technology is not because you use uranium more efficiently, it's not because of the carbon footprint, it's because a whole bunch of countries have got a stockpile of separated weapons-grade plutonium or non-weapons-grade plutonium that is very difficult to dispose of in any other way except either blending it with uranium into mixed oxide fuel or even better, recycling it in a fast reactor. So the UK is grappling with this issue right now. They have one of the largest stockpiles of separated plutonium that they need to deal with because it's a geopolitical risk. It's, it's just perceived that way, even though it's relatively small in volume, you've got to protect it. It could be diverted. You know, there's all these things they would rather avoid. You build fast reactors, you can work through that plutonium very fast. In, they're not just called fast reactors because of fast neutrons. They can deal with plutonium very quickly and denature it to the point in a decade or two these problems of proliferation could be solved by using this type of nuclear technology. Then for centuries afterwards, you can continue to, to burn it for fuel. OK. Uh, up the back here, yep. Um, if we were to switch to full-scale nuclear reactors here in Australia, what sort of upgrades would we need to see to our electrical distribution grid? And what sort of costs would that have in addition? Uh, yeah. Ian, can you...? <laughs> it would depend where you put them. Um, 
Uh, at the moment, not surprisingly, you have coal-fired plants built on or very close to coal fields. Uh, if you built nuclear plants, uh, the main consideration in Australia would be to put them on the coast so that you could use seawater for cooling. Uh, instead of, say, three uh, million tonnes of coal per year to a thousand megawatt coal-fired power plant, uh, you actually only need about uh, 27 to 30 tonnes of uranium fuel elements delivered to a thousand megawatt nuclear plant. So from the point of view of logistics of fuel, it doesn't matter where you put it. The cooling aspect would be very important in Australia. Uh, if you actually substituted, for instance, all of our coal-fired stations, which are mostly cooled using potable water and evaporating that, uh, with nuclear plants on the coast using seawater cooling, um, you would save almost the equivalent of Melbourne's water supply every year. A huge, a huge uh, byproduct, but, the, but you could put them anywhere, basically, and uh, the further, the further, of course, they were away from your existing grids and your existing load centres, the more transmission lines you'd have to build. But it wouldn't uh, necessarily be a big deal. Yep. Ken? And if you think about it in terms of a nuclear power station basically being plug and play for a conventional fossil fuel power station, you could essentially site them in more or less the same places and just plug straight into the grid. Mm. If you then compare this to what's needed by going to a 100% renewable future, and the Australian energy market operator has done this calculation, they were asked by government to produce a report which looked at what would be the prospects of in replacing our entire fossil fuel fleet with renewable energy resources? The answer to that question was yes, we can do it, and it can be done within a national electricity market. But the issue is what it would be the additional expense of going down that route. And one of the expenses is you would have to build more poles and wires to get at the resource because the resource is distributed throughout the continent. And that would be a significant increase in the levelised cost of electricity, taking into account a systems-based approach. Uh, and you would also have to build in greater capacity. And the reason for that is, although we live on this vast continent where it always is sunny somewhere and always is windy somewhere, it's maybe not as sunny or as windy as we would like it to be. <laughs> so you have to build in extra capacity to allow for that. So the short answer to your question is, it can plug straight into the existing grid if need be, but the alternatives would need extra work to make that happen. And so that's the choice we have to make, whether the cost of that is worth it or worth going down the nuclear route. Barry? And that alternative plan also has a really heavy reliance on biomass as a backup fuel. It's still renewable, but you're growing plants to substitute for coal um, as that backup thermal power supply. And there are logistical problems in getting that to the power plants. And frankly, biofuels have a major environmental impact. I'm an ecologist. Mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. the impacts that biofuels have mm -hmm. in driving, for instance, deforestation in, in many issues. tropical areas. Yeah. So Florida. it's not a light footprint to yeah. go down that pathway. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, here. Thanks. Uh, just to build on the questions of, uh, of, of sizing, cause I, <coughs> excuse me, because I think that's uh, the actual practical question. We saw when the Howard government uh, started down this route, uh, as was referred to before, backed off very quickly when the question came, you know, which electorate, which town is it going to be located in? Uh, we've heard the comment around, um, it would be engineering-wise optimal to locate them on the coast, close to load centres. Coast close to Sydney, close to Melbourne, that's some of the most expensive uh, developed real estate in the entire country. So the very practical question of how we would move forward to the questions of siting mm -hmm. and getting the social licence to uh, place a, a reactor, even a small one, uh, in a particular lo location, I think is a pretty fundamental question. Would we'll welcome your comments. And look, I'd, I'd be very interested in that. I think this issue of the social contract, which is such a pertinent question for something like wind power, and if we look at the, the different questions that we're balancing up there, how do you begin with the social contract for nuclear in heavily populated areas and areas that are environmentally fragile? Well, I think uh, that's an extremely good question because ultimately a government will have to address the siting issue when it comes to going ahead with a nuclear future for Australia, if that ever happens. 
And uh, can I just say, as a general observation, Australians have the biggest backyard in the world <laughs> and no one wants to build in it. And I don't care whether it's nuclear or wind or solar or breathing fresh air, no one wants to build anything in their own backyard in this country. And there's a kind of historical sociological perspective here. You know, we're a country that is very large, relatively underpopulated compared to the rest of the world, relatively new. We have a kind of a frontier mentality about our place, which says that we've just opened up this wonderful new land, here it is, we're going to plonk ourselves down and we're going to enjoy it. Well, Europeans haven't had that luxury for a thousand years or more. And people in Asia haven't had that luxury for a very long time either. They have to deal with problems in their own backyard every day. And if you look at what's happened in France with the introduction of the nuclear industry there, there are nuclear power plants right next to major metropolitan areas. And the people in France have made a contract with their government which says, we need the energy, we understand the issues, but we're prepared to have the siting next to us in order to satisfy our needs. Now, we need to have that discussion as well. Are we prepared to site a major nuclear power station or a coal power station or a wind farm, heaven forbid, uh, in our own backyard? <laughs> or are we going to forego the opportunity costs that this presents us when it comes to having electricity that is accessible and relatively inexpensive in the future in a way that, that overcomes the problem of climate change? Ian, I'd like to ask you, with your experience internationally, how that social contract has been facilitated in places like France or other places where nuclear power is much more widely implemented. I think there's a degree of pragmatism in some other cultures that, um, that is uh, a bit absent uh, in the political discourse in this country. Um, in a, in, in NIMBYism is huge in Australia, not just with regard to power stations, but desal plants, you name it, any major... Wind turbines, piece, Ian, Well, wind even turbines. wind turbines, which are relatively minor incursion, really. Uh, but so, And uh, you go from NIMBY to banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Um, so um, you, you, that, that is a problem. I think what the, the observation I'd make is that... Um, if you go to Korea, uh, here's a country that was a peasant economy basically 50 years ago. South Korea, North Korea still is. Um, and you go, you go there and you find that there are freeways, there are nuclear power plants, there are industries, there are all sorts of things everywhere. And the, if you ask questions, you find that people are generally accepting of that. They can see the benefits to the country they are prepared to have their own individual rights or convenience encroached upon a, a bit uh, to allow that to happen. Uh, and therefore, you've got this tremendous industrial development. Uh, I mean, uh, probably many people in this room would drive Korean, South Korean cars. The South Koreans have sold four nuclear power plants to the United Arab Emirates against stiff international competition and they are state-of-the-art uh, units for over 20 billion US dollars. Uh, I mean, this is a country that has moved incredibly fast, and you therefore have a different attitude to um, my rights versus the community benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think certainly in Australia we need to recover a bit of that. I don't know how it will be achieved, though, but I think Ken's comments are, are right on the money. And could I just say one other thing too? Uh, don't forget <coughs> that in Australia we already have a nuclear reactor. It's not used for generating power, but it sits in Sydney and it's sat in Sydney for a very long time and it's worked safely, cleanly, with no impact on the surrounding environment and it's essential for actually our wellbeing because it creates mm. radioactive isotopes which we use for medical processes. So this is not a new phenomenon. What is new and is difficult to get through people's psyche is the fact that this is something that could crop up not in the suburbs of Sydney, but in the suburbs of Canberra, Melbourne, Brisbane, or anywhere else. Yeah. And it's the newness of that concept that uh, is the issue here. So that's why I think that having, if you like, a, a trial experiment of a small modular reactor, perhaps in a remote location where it makes more sense, uh, just to get around this idea that having something new and nuclear nearby is, is, is in some way an unseen and terrible foreboding thing to do uh, would be an easier introduction to this country.
where everything is fraught with nimbyism. Well, yeah, but I think the, co the cultural context is very different by contrast with, some, say, somewhere like South Korea. And Absolutely. that's, that's a, a huge thing to factor in. Uh, gentleman up at the back here, yes. Uh, the... Yeah, it's Steve Bloom. For my sins, I'm the president of the Australian Solar Council, so you might imagine my perspective. Um, I suspect uh, Googling needs to be a little more thorough than what's evidenced from some of the things, things that have been said so far today. I've got a very simple view, and it's, and it's one that was raised by Ken earlier, um, and that is, it's about risk. And so far, I haven't seen any nuclear power plant in 60-odd years of development built by private funding and private insurance without capping by governments. Now, when that happens, and you know, the US Price-Anderson Act has $56 billion right now of guarantees, um, then I think probably nuclear is something we could accept. Now, I've had a conversation, I think the answer is that in fact, along the lines that Ken has said, I have no doubt, I've got no problem with R&D and continued research and development, and I actually suspect it will have a role in things like shipping. Uh, diesel fuel and liquid fuels is one of our biggest problems, and it doesn't matter how good your solar or wind is or any other renewable, um, and I suspect that a lot of the things that people were talking about are a bit out of date about whether you can provide a whole network. Smart distributed energy networks don't need the wind to blow all the time or the sun to be out all the time, you just need geographic dispersion. But um, that requires you know, long lunches or dinners and many red wines, I suspect, to resolve. Um, and I would also make a final point, and that is that I can see many things being done in South Korea. China is building 29 or 30 at the moment, uh, nuclear reactors. Uh, I have to say, I am sometimes antagonised by, antagonised by nimbyism. Uh, I prefer living here, and I prefer to have the choice and have a conversation like we're having now. So um, if the answer is we need dictatorship or we need some sort of enforcement, to get a particular industry across, well, I vote no. Well, let me, let me put to you that notion about the social contract, because I think this is central, and if we see it being such an essential matter with, with relatively sort of benign and easily assimilated renewable technologies, then this is major. We're not going to push this through the community in Australia in the way that is possible in countries where the cultural perspective is very different. Barry? I mean, broadly, if you look at any industrialised nation, any, they have a energy generation system that is primarily backed by government, was underpinned by government in various ways. Energy generation is a little like education or, or healthcare or military defence in that it requires this contract between government and industry to really get it going. Now, certainly you can build generators that aren't dependent on government and the smaller the generator, the less it contributes overall to the energy gener generation system the less likely it is to be connected with these massive infrastructure investments. Build large-scale, you need to have government buy-in. Uh, now, certainly with large-scale renewables in Australia, we've got plenty of government buy-in, plenty of it. We've got various uh, energy generation targets, we've got um, rebates, we've got um, renewable energy certificates and so on. These are all government-based incentives to scale up these energy sources. And if we had nuclear here, we definitely would need to have government-based approaches to getting it to high penetration. So I don't really see it as different to any other large-scale significant energy source. I see it having particular advantages in some of these areas and disadvantages in others, but I don't see it as uniquely different in terms of what it requires from society to make it happen on a large-scale. OK. Uh, gentleman here in the check show. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, it's really great having this debate, but um, with all due respect to the speakers and the questioners, it's really hard to know what to believe. Maybe we need ABC fact check to run over this. Um, <laughs> but, my, but my question is, uh, is economic. Um, I've, uh, I've read that um, the US aren't um, building any new reactors because of the drop in energy demand and the way that they've um, used their gas reserves internally rather than exporting them um, as some other countries have unwisely done. Um, and um, so I was wondering what your comments um, on that might be, but also on the, um, the levelling cost, um, I didn't really hear an answer where the levelling cost included the cost of decommissioning, which I'm told is about the same um, price as the cost of, of um, building. And also, um, if we are reducing the uh, energy demands that we have, wouldn't that affect the levelling cost quite significantly? Because I imagine it's taking into account the total energy that can be produced by the reactor. Ken? 
Okay, you've asked a, <coughs> a whole series of economically related questions, so I'll try to remember all of them. Um, so, first of all, decommissioning costs, typically they're of the same order of magnitude in terms of the levelised cost of electricity as the cost of waste storage, so a few percent, so that's the answer to that question. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, what is taken into account, uh, you, um, you need to take into account all the components of the, of the, uh, of the plant and the operating costs and all these things. Uh, and clearly the only thing that's not taken into account is uh, the risk factor, the insurance factor. Okay, so that answers that part of the question. You talked about the US. Okay, so the US is a very interesting case. They've now developed internally within a country that was a major net energy importer a new resource, which is unconventional gas, which is being used now to essentially displace a lot of their energy needs uh, that were previously satisfied by, for example, coal. Uh, and indeed, as we know, uh, gas is a less greenhouse gas intensity source of energy than coal is. It's about half. And so their emissions have gone down. Uh, paradoxically, though, the coal that they would have burnt otherwise is now being exported to Europe, where the price of gas at the Russian tap has been turned up to the extent that they are now importing US coal and burning it instead of the Americans. And, of course, they don't have their own indigenous nuclear industry as much as they used to after Fukushima because a whole lot of countries decided to change their perspective on nuclear, and so they're burning even more fossil fuels than they would have otherwise. And yet America's gone down, back to 1993 levels. A very interesting situation. So this only goes to emphasise the constant economic interplay between all these different sources of energy. And that's why we have to have good numbers on what is the levelised cost of electricity in order to make sensible decisions in an ever-changing environment internationally. Mm. Uh, Barry? And, and just a final point on that. Um, the biggest argument that is often put to me about not having nuclear energy here, in fact, stopping having nuclear energy here is that it's going to be too expensive. Uh, but in fact, what we're doing today is having a debate about whether we should even have nuclear available as an option, not whether we should have nuclear power here. And frankly, to me, the economic argument is the weakest against stopping that possibility of nuclear energy here, because if it's too expensive, businesses and government will calculate their levelised cost of electricity and they won't build it. So they'll only build it, ultimately, if there's an economic argument for it, uh, especially relative yeah. to other types of competitors. Uh, but we're not at that stage right now. We have, in law, in the Biodiversity Act, a minister shall not consider a nuclear power station no matter what. So we can have a power station. He could consider, uh, I don't say he would or he or she would uh, recommend it, but he could consider a thermal power station that burnt koalas as a fuel. And that would, that would be permitted by the minister to consider that and, and draw a commission to study it and whatever. You can't do that with nuclear power right now. So what we're arguing is that we at least get to the point where it's available as an option. If it's uneconomic, fine. If, new, if wind and solar are at the point then where they're the no-brainer and nuclear is too expensive, fine, we're not going to build it here. But we're not at that stage right now. I, I think we should just put a cone of silence over Barry's suggestion that we burn koalas as an energy <laughs> source. Um, with the microphone up here somewhere. Um, Good one. Yes. Uh, I like hearing about the contribution um, that nuclear makes to, to nuclear medicine. Um, and I also liked hearing about um, the levelised uh, versus system costs um, of nuclear power. And I'd also like to just say as well, as someone who's, who has unfixed views on, on nuclear, I, 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 I thank you for providing your time to, um, to, to promote a discussion on this important topic and it will assist the public in, in developing more um, knowledgeable views on this. I want to ask um, whether nuclear power provides an opportunity to, um, to replace to some extent or even totally um, the, the recent loss and the ongoing loss of high tech jobs that we're seeing in the automotive and aeronautical industries. Um, and I also want to ask, uh, on top of the, um, the system cost, uh, what additional costs, and there was some, um, some mention of uh, the total environmental costs as well. Um, how, how much is that worth um, uh, on our current understanding? Mm 
Uh, Ken, what's the economic potential? Well, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the shift in the Australian economy, uh, you're right that, uh, you know, there, there has been a move away from large-scale manufacturing to other industries. Uh, whether you would recapture some of that by having a nuclear industry that would take on uh, new skills is a, is a moot point. You would certainly have to train up a workforce that was conversant with the science and the engineering of the nuclear power industry. And indeed, at the Australian National University, we have the only experimental training facility in the country in nuclear science. I'm not talking nuclear power, I'm talking about nuclear science. Uh, with the accelerator facility that would indeed train that generation of nuclear scientists. But you'd need nuclear engineers as well. Uh, so if you were to ramp up a nuclear industry rapidly, you would most likely have to import some of that capability. And the reason for that is that it takes many years to train people uh, with the necessary skill sets in order to have the uh, appropriate level of expertise available to fulfil the regulatory obligations which we need. Now, having said that, it's going to take some time for the social licence to be granted between the Australian people and any government that wants to change this, and that will require a bipartisan governmental approach to things, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure of that. Secondly, you need to have the regulatory environment in place beforehand, and that's why I think it's important to have this discussion now, because it will take you at least three to five years for that to be set up. And then finally, once you get to that point, you need to have the people on board that can uh, build these nuclear power stations and to oversee them. Uh, so I think that uh, if we don't have this discussion now, then we're slowing that whole issue down to the point where we will be people limited. And, uh, and so we need to be very careful that uh, we, can, we can ramp up this uh, option if indeed we ever decide to do it. Mm -hmm. Ian, you wanted to come in? I just, uh, there's a number of questions there. The, the one I comment on is the difference of, put between the levelised cost at the, at the generating plant and the system cost of whatever option you're looking at. Uh, with nuclear power, the difference is very small, as it is with coal, uh, because it's a 24-7 baseload um, operation. And um, the, the, the fact that means that you've got uh, your grid connections and so forth, you don't need the same level of backup that, that you do with um, solar and wind. Uh, and um, the, um, the, the equation, the economic equation, comes out much better. Um, with regard to the, um, the other medical, medical aspects, yes, uh, it's probably outside this discussion, but Australia's forging ahead very well there. Uh, keep an eye on what ANSTO is doing, it's terrific. Um, but the, um, th this whole matter of, um, of the continuous, reliable supply most of the electricity that we use and depend upon in a country like this, most of the demand is for continuous, reliable supply, technical term for which baseload power. Uh, and nuclear is that, along with coal. Uh, and at the opposite extreme, you've got your intermittent renewables. One comment I'll make is that um, having um, just been riding in, in, um, in Priuses and um, hybrid Camrys, if we were to move to having a high input of electricity to our motor cars and that charging were done overnight, then the proportion of total energy electricity demand which could be supplied by continuous reliable baseload power increases hugely uh, and the net kilowatt hour cost would come down. So there's a, a lot of potential there if we see a future for electric vehicles, plug-in electric vehicles, in Australia or anywhere else. That's, that's a very big upside, I think, for nuclear versus uh, anything that is not continuous and reliable. Now, we've almost reached the, the end of our time, but there are two people with microphones and one lady at the very back who's been extraordinarily persistent. So I'll just ask you to be very quick if you can. Lady here. I think in future, the current generation will be regarded as a very wasteful one, and I wonder, um, what you think are the prospects for significant improvements in energy efficiency? Uh, Barry, can I put that to you? I think there are, there are always prospects for energy efficiency and where it's been economic to date, we've been pursuing them. If you look at how efficient, say, power generation plants are today compared to 200 years ago, maybe a steam engine was less than 1% efficient and now it's 40 to 60% efficient. So we, 
we gain efficiencies in terms of the generating technology, in terms of our lighting and so on, our, our refrigeration. But globally, the biggest fundamental issue is that there's a whole large fraction of the world's population that, in terms of modern generation of electricity, are 100% efficient. They haven't got any electricity. There are <laughs> 2.5 billion people with essentially no access to electricity. They've got nowhere to go but up. Uh, so even if we can stabilise our electricity demand, maybe drop it even by a third, I don't think we can because I think as we decouple our environmental impacts from our demand, for instance, by further recycling of everyday goods, intensification of agricultural productivity so that we use less land, all that takes actually more energy. And so I can see ways of reducing our environmental impact by using more energy, provided it's clean energy, it's not polluting energy. Uh, but even putting that aside, in a country like Australia and the US and so forth, we still have the vast majority of the world's population with essentially no energy that has got to get a lot more. And so energy efficiency has a role to play, but not a major one. OK. Uh, second last question, lady here. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, the, I had the impression that the major cost in electricity at the moment was in the transmission. It's both inefficient and very costly to transmit from point of um, source to the user. So with these new um, nuclear fast reactors, is it possible to have these more dispersed across the country than um, centralised power stations that we have at the moment? And secondly, if we are going to help these poorer countries that have no electricity at the moment, um, and, and they would have the same problems that we have transmitting the electricity if these nuclear reactors have to be centralised. And how are they going to cool theirs if they haven't access to seawater? Mm. Ken, is it an efficiency uh, process that we can implement here? Uh, the answer in short is probably not. Um, the reason that, uh, as you say, most of the charge when you get your electricity bill uh, comes from the transmission of electricity is we've had to build a transmission network that deals with the peak demand for electricity. And until we do something about the peak demand for electricity, we won't change that scenario. Indeed, what is happening, and we'll get back to the efficiency question, is people are actually decreasing their usage of electricity. Mm. You can see over time this graph has gone down since 2008. And so what that means is the relative contribution of this incredibly um, well-provided uh, uh, set of poles and wires is that it's going to get even more uh, a, a factor in, in our cost of, uh, of electricity. So what we need to do is lop the top off the, uh, the peak demand. And you can do that by efficiency measures, you can do it by uh, smart building systems, smart metering, all these things. That's where the low hanging fruit is in this country. Lop the top off the peak demand, have much smarter metering, time of use charging for electricity is absolutely essential and then we don't have to build any more poles and wires. Mm. And I think that's the argument that we're currently having about where the costs are in your power bill, poles and wires and the cost of financing them. And final question at the back of the room. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, a statement was made early on that the Fukushima disaster didn't kill anybody and didn't hurt anybody, um, which I, I think is actually an extraordinary statement. We know that uh, radioactive exposure, of which there's been a very large amount as a result of the disaster, increases rates of cancer. That's not disputed uh, in science. It's fairly basic. So if we look at the longer term health effects, they're going to be very great from the Fukushima disaster, but very hard to measure because they're widely dispersed. We've got hundreds of thousands of tonnes of radioactive water from the um, damaged reactors reaching the environment, reaching the groundwater and reaching the ocean. And that's partly because, yes, you can, you can shut down the nuclear chain reaction, but you can't shut down the heat which goes on and on and on being produced even after the chain reaction is stopped. Uh, hence the need for all the cooling water, which then becomes radioactive. So in addition to the radioactive exposure, um, there's the fact that 150,000 Japanese people are still displaced as a result of that disaster. Now, if you want to measure health effects, you could look at the health effects of displacing 150,000 people, and they're very, very great. Uh, children are not going out to play uh, because, the, because there's too much radioactivity around. Look at the health effects of children not going out to play. The health effects are very diverse. They're not easy to measure. So I think to make a statement that Fukushima didn't kill or didn't hurt anybody is, 
well, we can say it's untrue. I think that's being a little kind. So perhaps, um, perhaps some comment, please, on the longer-term health effects. OK. I've, Ian, can I go to you very quickly, please, if you No will. deaths, no injuries, uh, no serious irradiation of anybody from the accident itself. The evacuation, yes, the death toll from the maintained evacuation. Certainly it was prudent to evacuate people after a, a day or two when, people, when nobody knew what was happening in the reactors. But to maintain the, the evacuation for more than a week uh, has had a big impact. And there's a death toll of over 1,000 from that maintained evacuation, the stresses and strains on people. Uh, there is no good reason to maintain that, that evacuation over nearly all of the area. Uh, and that comes back to the nervousness of the Japanese government, which comes back to a whole lot of other factors. So. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd maintain the statement I originally made. I've reiterated it. Uh, I'd say if you want the details, look at the World Health Organization reports or the UNSCEAR report, the United Nations Scientific Committee on Atomic Radiation reports. Uh, they're definitive by the world's best experts in terms of health and radiation. Barry, last word to you. Okay. The, the closing point is that we can always identify potential health impacts of major catastrophic accidents, rare but, but catastrophic accidents like this, when nuclear power goes wrong. But we know when coal goes right, it kills 10 times more people. And so we have to bear that in mind, that it's a balance of risk and is it better the, the devil we know that's pervasive everywhere or is it, or is it worse to, to face those smaller risks um, that can be more easily managed? Ladies and gentlemen, clearly we could continue discussing this for quite a lot longer. Thank you very much for your informed and, as always, penetrating questions. But please thank Barry Brook, Ian Hawlacy and Ken Baldwin. Thank you.